Everybody else is taller here, okay? So I have to put that microphone down. Well, I bring you greetings from Metro Manila, the Philippines, from the Brethren of Foundation Baptist Church. So good evening to everyone. What a joy it is to be back here after two years of being stranded in Metro Manila due to the pandemic. But we thought this was an opportunity that the Lord did actually open for us so that we can come and visit the churches that we have been in contact with here. And of course, one of the churches we feel very much at home with is Bergen Bible Baptist Church. The only thing that I miss here, of course, Pastor Max. Okay? So, but uh, I should envy him. That's why we should envy him. He's in a far better place than we are, the truth of the matter is. Okay? So, at home with the body, but present with the Lord, no longer by faith, this time by sight. That was what I was actually anticipating when I had my procedure, my angioplasty last uh, 2020, June 2020. Um, <clears throat> my wife was trying to monitor my oxygen. I was having some heart, uh, I don't know, chest pains. So I was telling her, this is something unusual. But I thought, uh, uh, and that was sometime during the birthday of Daniel as well. So there was a celebration. I had to pick up somebody. And I noticed I was really going slow until finally, that was a Saturday. Um, so my wife kept monitoring my uh, oxygen level. And then she, then she was, con of course, consulting on another member who was a doctor and other doctors as well. So, so, so somebody suggested to put an oxygen and all of that. And it, to make the long story short, Sunday, uh, or rather, was it Saturday? Saturday, she said, uh, the, the doctor said, Pastor Bob, we're not getting to the bottom of this. You need to go to the hospital. And that was the height of the COVID, okay? And I had pneumonia. So they said, oh, definitely I'll be, suspect, I'll be a COVID suspect. But I said, Lord, I don't know how much it will cost and whatever it will entail, but if this is your will, then so be it. And thankfully, you know, after being confined, the doctor said, you know, after becoming through tests, he said, you will need to go through an angiogram. All right, so we'll go through an angiogram. So when can we schedule that? No, it's going to be now. Oh, is that so? Okay. Then after the angiogram, when you need to have to go through an angioplasty. All right, so when will they reschedule that? It's this week. I said, that soon? <laughs> and sure enough, the two days later, I was having this kind of heart attack. And, and so they said, you have to be, you know, go through the procedure right now. So I called my wife, told her about it. And uh, I was really during that time, I said, Lord, if you're going to take me home, I'm really excited to see you face to face. But um, <clears throat> my concern is, of course, my wife and, of course, or my family, Daniel. And it's, but, you know, Apparently, the Lord let me go through it. So we were in, in COVID ward and all of that. And uh, and while we were a COVID suspect, they say 40% of our bill will have, I mean, will be, our bill will be 40% higher because of uh, being in COVID uh, ward. So so they placed me into a test. And then after the angioplasty, three hours later, the test results came out. I'm negative. So, But they already billed me anyway. So... But anyway, so but we're thankful after that, uh, you know, the, the doctor suggests you need to go through a rehab and all of that. Uh, and there's a package that includes uh, rehab, physical therapy, and psychology, and psychiatry. And what? I said, he so usually goes through psychiatry. And I'm a pastor. I don't need that. I said, I, I know how to, to have my soul's needs met th through the Lord Jesus Christ. So they, we had wonderful opportunities to share the gospel during that time. But all of this to say that we're thankful Apparently, after going through that, I said, Lord, it is very clear to me that you have something else for me to do. My mission is not done yet. And so it's been our prayer since then that, Lord, help me to finish my course and finish it with joy. Okay. And that's exactly what Paul said in Acts chapter 20, the passage I'd like for us to dwell in for the next three, Sunday, or three days okay, for this missions conference. is Let's turn the Bibles, please, to Acts chapter 20. Okay, we are, for those of you who are familiar with the text, this is the portion when the Apostle Paul called the elders of the church of Ephesus. And while Paul was calling and addressing a group of pastors or elders, you say, the pastor, that is not for us because we're not all pastors here. Well, maybe that's the case, apparently. But you know that uh, God's standard for pastors is God's standard for all Christians? 1 Timothy chapter 3, we don't, we don't have to turn there, but 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul said, delays on the qualifications of a bishop, and notice what he says, the bishop then, next the words, must be blameless. Should not all Christians be blameless? 
Of course, all born-again Christians should be blameless. But for the leaders of the church, they must be. The Greek word dei, it's a moral necessity. Of course, some Christians are just new in the faith. One week, two months, one year, three years, and it's too early for them to be filled in to the ministry. That's why Paul says to the pastor, he should not be a novice, not, new, not a neophyte, not new in the faith, because quick promotion can get into one's head, and pride, eventually Satan uses that to destroy not only the preacher, but also the ministry. But all I'm driving at here right now is to establish this fact. God's standard for the Christian or for the pastor is God's standard for all men. God does not have double standards. His standard is for all Christians, holiness. And that's true for me, that's true for the pastor, that's true for the deacons, that's true for every born-again child of God. However, for the leaders, it must be evident. And if they don't meet those qualifications, then they are not fit for that leadership position. They can still serve God in another capacity, however, as believers. So, all of that to say that these passages in Acts chapter 20, while Paul was addressing the elders of the church at Ephesus, are God's words not only to them, but it's God's words for us. That is why I entitled these series, A, Char a Charge to Christian Witnesses. A charge to Christian witnesses. And for this first message, we'll be going through all the entire section for all four messages until Sunday. But uh, for, this me for this message, first message, let's turn to Acts chapter 20. We'll look at verses 17 down through verse 20. And shall we all rise, please, to give God honor and due reverence, reading this portion responsibly. Verses 17 down through 20 together. Okay. Verse 20, we read it together, but we start responsibly from verse 17. I'll read verse 17. And from Miletus, we're in Acts 20, and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in, in weight of the Jews. Verse 20. Nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you from house to house. Let us pray. Our Father, we humbly come before thee. We thank you for this opportunity, the privilege to gather around your word and to feast upon its eternal treasures. We ask, Father, the Holy Spirit to open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things under thy law. Help us, Lord, to have hearts that are ready to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to deliver our souls. And we shall thank you for it. Have thine own way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm a little, uh, uh, this, is a, this is a new pulpit, isn't it? Because I thought the pulpit was getting taller or was I getting shorter? I wasn't so sure. So, But anyway, I hope you can see me right there. So, <clears throat> All right, this is a charge to Christian witnesses. And more specifically in its context, Paul is talking to pastors uh, in the church, in the among, in, in Ephesus. I'm breaking down my message, this section. This is one message of Paul to the elders. I'm break, we're breaking it down to four. We'll talk about tonight the Paul's priorities in missions or in ministry. Tomorrow we'll talk about Paul's philosophy in ministry or missions. On Sunday morning we'll talk about Paul's pursuance in ministry and missions. And lastly, for Sunday afternoon, we'll talk about Paul's prescriptions in ministry and missions. Okay. So tonight, we'll talk about Paul's priorities in ministry. But let's go back to that Paul's day, first century. The Apostle Paul was living in a time when they were under the Roman Empire. Christians then were haunted and hated people. Emperor worship was the rule of the day. Anybody who claims to have placed their trust in Jesus Christ as Savior can be easily charged with treason. Because basically, when you say, I am embracing Jesus Christ as my Lord, you're saying, I no longer recognize Caesar as God. You can be charged with treason. Yes, that's why Christians were haunted and hated people. And we would think, maybe we, some of us might think it may have been easier during that time, or maybe be tougher. But let's compare that with our day. Okay, we're living in a day of relativism. In the days of Judges, isn't that what the book of Judges said? 
It says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Is that the day in which we live? That is the day in which they live. We're living in the day of narcissism. You know what narcissism is, right? You remember Narcissus, that Greek mythology character? He saw himself in a pool of water, that is an image of himself, and boy, did he fall infatuated of himself. Boy, did he love himself. Oh, you smile, isn't it? Because that can, you, can, you and I can all relate to that, isn't it? And that's where we get narcissus. It's egotism. And that's what Paul said in the last days, men it, perilous times shall come and men shall be lovers of their own selves. That's narcissism. That's the day in which we live. We're living in the day of hedonism. Hedonism is the philosophy, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Some people are living in a Disneyland, in a, an amusement park. You know what an amusement park? In the Greek word museo is the Greek word which means to think. When you put the prefix a, that means negative, not to think. You know people go to the amusement park not to think. And some Christians live this world, they're not thinking. They're still living in an amusement park. They're living in a bubble. Especially for Christians, and I would say many people from the third world who come to this country, Filipinos. Okay, may I get personal? Some people leave the country and find their legitimacy here. They have responsibilities at home uh, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Philippines, but they come here as long as they get that green card. Oh, God has blessed me. I'm now legitimate. And they forget all the responsibilities back home. I was talking to one pastor earlier. They said, yeah, that's true, Pastor. You know, when, when we, uh, that's one of the more the prayer lists in many churches but among Filipinos. Green card. Our papers. Once they get it, you don't see them anymore. I'm not saying it's true with, it, with people here. What I'm saying is people are living in a Disneyland, in an amusement park. They're not thinking how they should live. In fact, Disneyland, as we know, has turned woke, right? <clears throat> uh, and it shows in one of their programs, isn't it? They, they propagate this philosophy. It's a deep word. It's called Hakuna Matata. The problem-free philosophy. But it's actually a form of escapism. Okay, It's a form of escapism. I want to escape from reality and build my own world so that I will not think. And that's how people, even Christians, think. Harry Blamires in his book, The Christian Mind, is saying that some Christians, one thing that is lost in the church today is Christians are no longer thinking biblically. And that's a real problem in the church. It's not just a problem outside. It's also within the household of faith. And no wonder the, the, the catalog of sins that Paul mentions in 2 Timothy 3 regarding the marks of the end times are the same catalog of sins we find in Romans chapter 1. Well, 2 Timothy 3 is talking about perilous times shall come. These are the marks in the last days. Romans chapter 1 is the context. Is These are the characteristics of a pagan culture. In other words, paganism, even towards the end times, will still be very rampant. Let me use a more contemporary term. What about wokeism? Okay. Where, especially in this country, sadly, I read already your pastor mentioning it. See, the roots of the Judeo-Christian ethic are being pulled out. Christianity is not only, the, the, its heritage is not only fast eroding. I've talked to many pastors from east to west. And they're telling me, no, Pastor Bob, it's not eroding. It's gone. This is the situation in which we live. And some people think, let's save America. Let's save the world. Let's save Mother Earth. Let's save the they want to save everything else. But do you know, let me remind you, Christian, God did not call us to save this world. This world is God headed for judgment. We are called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we can win people one by one out from this present evil world before God pours out His judgment on this sin-sick world. So, we preach the gospel. People will hear. Some of them will not, will reject. Maybe a few. Maybe even two or one will respond. And when one responds, what do you say? You say, praise the Lord. You know why? Because the Bible says, the heavens rejoice even in heaven just for one sinner that repents. So our responsibility is not to save this world. 
Our responsibility is to preach the gospel and allow the Holy Spirit to use His Word to bring conviction and ultimate conversion. Paul's words, he said, we can only plant, we can only, only water, but it is God who gives the increase. So we just keep on planting. Aggressively and accurately, the message of the gospel. And let the Holy Spirit do the convicting and the converting. So here in the book of Acts, of course, if we let's go back to our text. Paul is addressing a group of Christian pastors or, like I said, a charge to Christian witnesses. Therefore, these are not God's words not only to the elders of Ephesus. These are God's words for every born-again child of God in succeeding generations even today. God saves us for His glory. God is glorified when we bear fruit for Him, fruit of character, fruit of conduct, fruit of Christ-likeness, and fruit of converts. And so we should go, as the Great Commission tells us. Okay. So what we have here is Paul's charge to the elders. It calls in verse 17, he was calling, for, to the el to calling the elders of the church. It's interesting that in this passage alone, let me just mention in passing, Acts 20, 17, they are the elders. In Acts 20, 28, it says, Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. So these elders are also called overseers. And they are said, they are told to feed. It's the Greek word for mean. The word means to shepherd, where we get the word pastor. Feed the flock of God, which is he hath purchased with his own blood. Meaning to say, oh, I'm driving this point simply to point out that elders, uh, 28, overseers, pastors, is referring to the same person. Okay, because this is Paul addressing them. But, like we said, this applies to every born-again child of God as a Christian witness. We are not called to, sa to save the world. We are called to preach the gospel. So Paul, serving him, uh, as we should be reminded, serving the Lord is not only one of the reasons he saves us, or that's one of them. It is one of the fruits of salvation when we get saved. Notice in Paul's life, in Acts chapter 9, verses 5 to 6, we don't have to turn there. It was about eighty thirty four. That's when he got converted to Christ. This address in Acts chapter 20 to the elders of the church or to these Christian witnesses was around 59 AD, which means it's been, it has been 25 years since he, will, he asked the Lord, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 25 years in his Christian walk since he asked that question. And ever since he asked that question 25 years before the, this message, he kept on doing what God wanted him to do, and he was set in his heart to do and to finish what God called him to do. Is that what Jesus said? To him? My, my meat is to do, to do the will of him that sent me, and to, same thing, finish. And that should be our responsibility. God has called every born again child of God to do. We have a mission to do. And we are to finish it. Our, our responsibility is to preach the gospel and establish and propagate his kingdom, not ours. Dr. Douglas, Douglas McLaughlin mentioned before in his book, the Reclaiming Authentic Fundamentalism, he said, the problem with many past pastors is that many preachers have been so impatient with the Lord's return, they have, Lord, the Lord's kingdom, that have decided to build their own. That's not our work. We're to advance His, not our kingdom. That's what Scripture tells us. But sadly, many Christians, once they get saved, now they get become more aware with what God has called them to do, many of us may never finish the work we have, may have started. They th the, the, many, the, the thing that we pursue in order to give meaning in our life Unfortunately, for many Christians, it will never be accomplished. Let me give you two reasons. One, they sin unto death. What is that? The Bible talks about the sin unto death. Christians become disobedient to God. God spanks them. They persist in disobedience. God will say, listen, you've been such a dishonor to me there. I, just might, I might as well take you home. The sin unto death. The other reason why Christians not, will not be able to finish their God-given course is because they waste time. The Bible says... We are to redeem the time knowing that the days are evil. 
Moses in his psalm said, Lord, teach me to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We need to be praying for that. Many of us are still living in Disney World. We are going to establish the magic kingdom, our kingdom. When Moses said, teach me to number my days so that I may apply my heart unto wisdom. So are you now awake? I hope you're outside your bubble, outside the amusement part. I am encouraging you from tonight on to the last day of the conference and maybe Lord willing after that to put on your thinking caps. Start thinking, thinking through what the Bible says, thinking it through and apply it in your day-to-day -day life. What does God want me to do? Just like Paul, Lord, what will you have me to do? And at the end of his life, in this chapter alone, he says, I have finished my course. At least in the missionary, in the ministry in Ephesus. And I'm praying that all of us, I'm praying this for myself, my wife, my family, our church back home, and for all of us who are here, we may be able to say at the end of our course, I finished it and finished it with joy. And some people are trying to finish it. They're, oh boy, they're they griping. Oh, uh, the Christian life is. No, finish it with joy. That's what the Bible says. So let's talk about the, uh, our topic tonight, Paul's priorities in his mission or in his ministry. Despite living in the days of the Greco Roman Empire, similar to our own, the world was not exactly the heaven. And let me remind all of us Filipinos and those from the third world, and I guess even some Americans, and I did mention this in, in Connecticut last Sunday in the, pre, in, the, in the church that is mostly Caucasians, is that America is not heaven. There must be a better place than this. Amen. Especially in the light of what we're seeing. And sure enough, there is. I'm thankful I can, I can bring that good news. All of that's taking place right now is simply God's way of reminding us, hey, you and I need to be homesick for our eternal abode, Amen. for heaven. So let's talk, at, let's talk about the priorities of Paul in ministry in these verses alone, 17 to 20. The Bible says Paul writes, and oh, the, rather Luke records Paul's message because Luke was the human author of the gospel of the, of the book of Acts. And in every portion of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there's the human author, there's the divine author. Okay. Sometimes you say, Paul said this, Luke said this. No, that's the human author. But while they were the human authors, there's a divine author. The Bible is of dual authorship because of the miracle of inspiration. God used these men fallible as they are, and they wrote scripture as they were moved by no less than the third person of the Trinity, and thus preserving them from error. And while these were God's words, or these, the writer's words to their original audience, these are the words of God for God's people of succeeding generations as well. These are God's words for us today. And therefore, let's look at what he says regarding his uh, um, priorities in ministry. Let us take note, verse 17 and 18. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus <clears throat> and called the elders of the church. Of course, he's talking to pastors, leaders. Because if you are able to strengthen and encourage the leaders, then that you trickle down the blessing all to the rest of the regular membership. This is not surprising why Satan's often favorite fiery uh, targets for his fiery darts are the pastors. You can expect that Satan's darts will be hurled at him more than the other, any others. Because you smite the shepherd, you scatter the sheep. That's what the Bible says. So we read in verse 18, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came unto you and into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by lying in wait of the Jews. Let me pause there. I have a three-point outline for this particular portion of the, my message. First, we'll, you will see his priorities. First, he had transparency and consistency of life. Second, he had a spirit of service. And thirdly, he had boldness in teaching. Let's flesh this out one at a time. Transparency and consistency of life. That's what we see here in verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know, for a fact, Okay. From the first day that I came into you, after what 
After what manner I have been with you at all seasons. You know this. And how did they know it? Because Paul's life was transparent. He had nothing to hide because, he, you know, for believers, for leaders especially, but also for all believers, remember the first qualification of a bishop, he must be blameless. By the way, that's not equivalent to, the, it's not synonymous to the word sinless. If a bishop is to be sinless, then none of us can be a pastor. Blameless is different from sinless. A blameless person is still fallible, can fumble and stumble and fall. Blameless basically means that they cannot throw any accusation against you. And that every pastor and every Christian witness, although fallible as we are, should learn to keep short accounts with God. Never prolong or procrastinate any issue that you have with God. You may have sinned against God this morning, this afternoon, and even just earlier tonight while driving on the way here. And if you know you, are, you have sinned, the Spirit of God has brought it to your conscience, then keep your accounts short with God. Confess that sin immediately with God. Don't stay in a situation when you have a prolonged time of being outside of fellowship with God. That's the case of the Apostle Paul. He never claimed to be sinless. In fact, he said in Timothy, I am the chief of all sinners. In Romans chapter 7, he talked about the struggle with inside, in inside him. And he said, that is in me, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, Paul recognized. And so I'm a little bit disturbed in some professed Christian circles. I, perhaps some of you have come across some of this literature, particularly in Reformed circles. They talk about the one-natured Christian. And what does that mean? They, they believe that the sinful nature has been eradicated since they got saved. And my, my, I was just talking to a lady from Texas on this trip, and she brought that question to me. She mentioned three or four preachers that she would watch on television, popular preachers, maybe even five. So she brought this question to me, and she wanted to be clarified, and I'm glad she brought it up. I knew exactly who she was referring to. And so I said, a one-natured Christian, a sin nature eradicated. Do you still sin? Well, they, well, the preacher said, you know, we are no longer, what did he say? We are no, we're not called sinners saved by grace. We're not sinners anymore after you get saved. We are called saints. Well, that's true. The Bible calls believers saints. Paul addresses the church of Corinth to the saints in Corinth, in Ephesus, etc., etc. Yes, believers are sanctified in Christ, therefore are saints. But we are still sinners saved by grace. Why did John say in his first epistle, John was talking about how do you distinguish a genuine, authentic Christian from an, a, a, a counterfeit? He said, if we profess, okay, if we say that we walk in, in the light, or that we say that we have fellowship with him. And yet, we actually, in practice, walk in darkness. What did John say? We lie and do not the truth. Many people profess Christianity, but their practice is inconsistent with their profession. And John is saying, when th things like that happen, that does not mean the Christian never sins. But when that happens, there are times, this is a time to put that person to the test, especially ourselves. But that same, that, in that same epistle, what did John say? If we say we have no sin, then we lie and do not the truth. Anyone who says, I don't have a sinful nature anymore. It's been eradicated. Hmm. According to the word of God, we lie and do not the truth. We're making God a liar and his word is not in him. Now, I don't know if you're, you, you're, you're, you're able to relate or identify some of the literature you may have come across regarding the one-natured Christian. Perhaps that will come out during our question time sometime towards maybe tomorrow or Sunday. But here's, that's the point. Here, Paul, as far as Paul is concerned, he knew he was, in, in, he was fallible. He knew he would still stumble and fall. But nonetheless, he was transparent. He had transparency and consistency of life. That's still found in verse 18. You know from the first day that I came into you in Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. That's consistency of life. Transparency meaning they had nothing to hide because he was blameless. 
If you, you know of a Christian, and some Christians are still living very secretive lives, perhaps it's because there are things in their life that they don't want to be discovered, to be exposed. Remember, Christians live in glass houses. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. Let me turn there very quickly. What did the apostle pay, say to these Corinthian believers? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Okay? Some people will not read the Bible. But if they will not read the Bible, they will read you who say you read the Bible. We are known and read of all men. We are the living epistles of the Lord, known and read of all men, especially church leaders. See? So therefore, it's important, as far as priorities are concerned, that we maintain a blameless life, transparency and consistency. This is probably the strongest defense of the Christian faith, a consistent life. I'm preaching to us as I'm preaching to myself. Uh, this may be an apologetic, the word apologia in the Greek is what we're finding. We find that in 1 Peter 3.15. Peter says we are to be always ready to give an answer. To every man. That word answers the Greek word apologia. That's where we get the English apologetics. It's in translated answer. It's translated defense in Philippians. We should be ready to give a defense or an answer regarding the Christian faith. But you know what? The strongest answer or defense in the Christian faith is a transparent and a consistent life. We may not be astute and as uh, sharp in answering every point of doctrine of uh, um, accurately, but when they see that this man has a changed life, is consistent and transparent. That's a strongest apologetic or answer to unbelievers. Amen. See, I don't know if you heard of that story of four men arguing as to which is the best translation. It's the King James 1611. We don't even read that, by the way. 1611. No, 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 it's the New American Standard Bible system, person number two. No, no, it's the New Infall, oh, no, New Infall, no, New International, NIV, okay, New International Version. No, it's the uh, Christian Standard Bible. They were all arguing, and there's, one, there's this 10-year-old kid who said, I know of a best translation that I've seen. Boy, they were all surprised. I saw the translation of the Bible in the life of my grandpa. Powerful statement. It's the strongest apologetic we can show the unsaved world. So let me ask you, how is our Christian life? Are we blameless? Is there sin in our life that has been left unconfessed and you are aware of it? You've been trying to cover it? Remember David tried to cover his sin for a long period of nine months? God exposed it anyway. See, because the Bible says, he that covers his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. So, why are some people scared of being transparent? Because they're, they, they are aware, they're probably concerned that their faults may be seen by others. Now, we all have our faults, don't we? We should not be surprised if the person is imperfect, because we all are. But being blameless means we learn to keep short accounts with God. We must be willing to be transparent. The Lord uses our lives as a teaching visual aid. Consistency as well. At all seasons, as Paul said, we must seek to be consistent while allowing for inconsistency. I hope that does not sound like a contradiction. We must seek to be consistent while allowing for inconsistency because we are fallible. And when somebody fumbles and stumbles and falls, we understand that we are, are framed, that we are but dust. Is that what Psalms 103 says? God understands their frame. We are but dust. We fumble and stumble and fall. But the problem is, the problem comes when the person sins and he persists in his disobedience. And he holds his ground in his disobedience and even raises his arm of fist of rebellion against God. I am going to do it my way. That's when we have to confront him and if necessary, part ways from him. I cannot go that direction. I love you, brother, but you're going a different direction the way I want my follow my Savior. And while I love you, my brother, I cannot follow you in your, in your direction. 
That's when separation is required from persistently erring brethren. Don't say, I'm separated from you because why? Because you sin. Hey, have you tried to restore him? And you've tried to restore him. Has he repented? If, you've re if he has been repented, then you have restored him. Then he's won. Praise the Lord. But no, he has already apologized. No, but he has to be nailed to the cross anyway. <laughs> have you seen some Christians like that? Boy, are they really angry. Even if the person has already apologized. And by the way, do you know what the word forgiveness means? Afiemi? The word means let go. Oh, pinatatawan na kita, I forgive you. But you still have that grudge. Therefore, you have not let go. See? So, transparency and consistency of life. This is one priority Paul had in his life. If you want to be an effective witness, you have to be transparent and consistent in your life. Second, he had a spirit of service. A spirit of service. Notice in verse 19, he was serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. Aside from transparency and consistency of life, he had a spirit of service. We must recognize that our ministry involves service to the Lord. Okay? The willingness to serve. See, the aim is not to be popular with people in ministry. The goal, sooner or later, you will have to choose if you're going to serve God or are you going to please men. If you want to be witness, an effective witness for the gospel, then what, you have, what, should, what should consume our hearts is really we're seeking to do this in order to please men. Not to build my kingdom, not to, uh, you know, to impress people, but to, not to be popular with people, but to simply serve the Lord. Paul recognized that he was serving God. And while he was serving people as well, he recognized that in First Thessalonians, he was serving people, but eventually, and oftentimes, he would see people disappoint him, and it's not common in ministry. You serve people, yung pinakatinulungan po mo, and you keep on serving and serving, and then the very hand that feeds them will bite. Ouch! And when that happens, you get back and say, well, at the end of the day, I was not ser I was serving him, but as I, was, I was doing it as a service for the Lord. Amen. So it's a spirit of service to the Lord. It's easy to be discouraged when people bite us back or backbite us or stab us at the back uh, despite our efforts to win them the gospel or to help them, to show kindness and affection towards them, and yet they still turn their back against us. Then you get back and say, Lord, you know how my heart it's easy to be bitter, it's easy to be angry, but I'm not allowed to do that because the Bible says that's sin, but I'm going to give it to you, Lord, and I'll serve you nonetheless. We must maintain a singleness of heart. Turn to me to, uh, first of all, to Galatians chapter 1. Two passages here. The Apostle will mentions this to the believers in Galatia. Ephesians, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. Okay, remember in this context, Paul was talking to the Galatian believers in Galatia. Why? Because there were some false teachers who crept in, introducing that salvation was something to be earned through human merit, through law-keeping, through circumcision. And therefore, Paul said in verses 6 through 9, I'll read this very quickly. I marvel that you are so soon from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though even we, even one of us apostles, or even an angel from heaven, even for Gabriel or Michael, even if any one of us preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be what? Anathema, accursed. A very strong term of condemnation. As we said before, so I now, say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have preached unto you, or that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I not persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, then I should not be the servant of Christ. That's what he said in verse 10. So when you serve God, your purpose, your burning, consuming passion ought to be to serving Him. A spirit of service, while at the same time serving men. 
But the purpose is not to be popular with men. It was to serve them with the truth of the word of God. Furthermore, we must maintain singleness of heart. Ephesians chapter 6. Jump with me there. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5. Paul said, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. This is talking about employee-employer relationships or slave-master relationships. So be obedient to your masters. 20th century context, 21st century. Oh, be obedient to your employers as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Verse 7, with goodwill, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So in other words, our purpose, we should, have, we should maintain singleness of purpose and singleness of heart. What will Jesus say as I continue to be a witness for him? It's not what will the pastor say. What will the people say? What will my peers say? Because if your ultimate goal is to please the Lord, then you will proclaim the message as accurately and as boldly as you can. So like Paul, we must do it. Acts chapter 20. Let's go back to Acts chapter 20. We must do our service. Notice. What's the next word? In verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. That means devoted submission, contented obedience, in total acknowledgement that we are His servants, and therefore acknowledging our sense of inadequacy in ourselves to lead us to rest in His grace, to lead us to rest in His power as we continue to conduct ministry. As we seek to be a witness for the gospel, we acknowledge that it is not in our capacity to convert men. In Tagalog, one, one preacher was telling me in the Philippines, uh, that's what you call Holy Pilit, the Holy Spirit. No. We kind of twist people's arms so that they can make a profession. We can add another statistic in our card. Okay. No, we don't do that. See, with all humility of mind, that is, he, we should recognize our sense of inadequacy because we, this is God's work. This is God's message. We're just delivery boys and delivery girls. It's the Holy Spirit who does the convicting and the converting. Despite the suffering, notice he says in verse, seven, verse uh, 19 still, serving the Lord with all humility. Notice that word, all. Okay. You cannot be bragging, in a, you know, I'm the pastor of this church. You know, there was one preacher who was telling me, this is a scenario in the Philippines. One pastor was called. He was invited, an invited speaker, and the pastor stood in the pulpit and said he started rebuking the congregation he said maybe if the mayor stood up in this pulpit you would have all stood up but this is a man of God you did not dare stand, dare stand up I said wow boy did that room get really cold with much of his air we cannot be like that kind of a that's not a servant it says serving with all humility of mind. Anybody here who is humble, please raise your hand. <laughs> I was about to, I was teasing our congregation. I'm about to write a book entitled, How to Be Humble Like Me. Okay. <laughs> so notice it says further in verse 20. It says, uh, rather verse 19 still. With all, with, and with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations. So this is his spirit of service. When you be a witness for the gospel and serve him, you, sure, there will, you can anticipate some opposition, some suffering, as he was indicating. He says with many, notice, he had suffering as indicated by his tears. Tears within, as well as temptations without. In the New Testament, you find this is a, Tears is a euphemism to describe his experiences with those who sought his life. Really, the truth is, if you study Paul's life, people were haunting at his life. He were, they were wanting to kill him. His fellow Jews wanted to cut his life, wanted to incarcerate, and he was incarcerated. His fellow Jews wanted to kill him, literally. But he uses the term tears in a very euphemistic way. In the book of Romans 9, 2 to 3, a, we don't have to turn there. We find in three instances in the New Testament of Paul shedding tears. You mean the man of God like Paul shedding tears? Yeah. 
He was not hesitate to shed tears. In Romans 9, he wept for the lost souls. Do you know anything of that weeping? You cry to God, Lord, I'm praying for this person that he will get saved. Amen. Do you know anything of that? In 2 Corinthians 2 verse 4, he wept for carnal Christians. Do you know anything of that weeping? In Acts chapter 20 verse 31, we will go later in Philippians 3 18, he wept against the threat of false teachers. He knew the danger of false teaching. He knew that many people will stand behind pulpits and lead thousands, if not millions, astray from the gospel, counterfeit gospels. And he knew the serious dangers and ramifications of false doctrine. And he would weep because of those, those instances. Do you know anything of that? Paul was, had tears. And this is part of his service to the Lord. Serving and being a witness for Christ would mean serving him with humility despite suffering. He also faced temptations. He mentions that in verse 19. With many tears and temptations. Tears within and temptations without. Is a service for Christ is a warfare where many wounds must be received for God's good purposes. Remember, the Christian life is not a playground. The Christian life is a battleground. And every time you take your stand for the Lord and stand up for Jesus Christ, you can expect Satan's fiery darts hurled against you. You should not be surprised when Satan hurls his fiery darts against you. Because the Christian life is not a playground. So God considers the Christian servant when he has or his or her life in order. This was Paul's priority in his mission. And he does it with all humility and willingness to suffer. Not when his picture is in every Christian magazine. Okay, that's what I'm after. Okay. That's not Paul's goal. It didn't matter whether he had the applause of men. As long as he had the praise of God. And that should be our desire. At the judgment seat of Christ. I remember sharing this with you, I think. When I, every time I talk about the judgment seat of Christ, we stand before God. When I talk about that subject, some, this is a very commonly asked question to me. Pastor, at the judgment seat of Christ, is there going to be a huge white screen? And it will say, this was your life. And therefore, everybody else at the judgment seat of Christ will see. By the way, the judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. Every one of them will be, will be there. Every one of us who will be there will enter heaven. But it's going to be a judgment not to determine who's going to heaven or hell. It's a judgment to determine who's been faithful and who's going to receive a reward and who will suffer loss. So when I, when I was not asked that question, he said, you know what, quite frankly, I cannot find any passage in Scripture about the huge white screen at the judgment seat of Christ. But I'm beginning to be doubtful or questioning what prompts that question. Is it possible that you're asking that question because imagine even at the judgment seat of Christ, you are not thinking about what the judge will say. You're more concerned about what others will say. Even at the judgment seat? So, serving the Lord with humility amidst tears and temptation. Last point for tonight, verse 20. Okay. I know this is already past nine. Verse 20, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. That's point number three, boldness in teaching. He kept back nothing that was profitable. He did not withhold anything, anything what? That was profitable. And what is profitable? Paul said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Christians need to be inoffensive in particular opinions. But in cases of truth, in matters regarding the word of God, in issues between right and wrong, we need to, be, we need to present the truth as it is. It's interesting. We were in the Philippines and I, one preacher in Seattle, an American pastor, shared it with me. You know, in this in our church, there's been a, almost a split. You know, People were fighting over should we wear a mask or not? 
And boy, they, they have strong opinions about it. Or are you in favor of the current incumbent president or not? That could be a heated debate. We were in Seattle and we met some Filipinos there. We just had, yeah, we just had an election. Well, I, you don't sound happy for the results. In others, they sounded happy. Um, but you know what? Whoever seats in Malacanang or in the White House doesn't really matter, you know? Because our hope is not in government. Our hope is in the Lord. We are looking forward to that day when Jesus Christ will touch on earth and rule and reign from Jerusalem and therefore establish a his millennial kingdom. And that'll be seven years after the rapture. See. So for Paul, so you know, one of my point I'm driving is we should be bold in our teaching. In things that are matters where Bible is clear, then we should be bold. Yes, speak the truth and speak it in love, but be sp but speak the truth nonetheless. But in matters where, you know, it's a matter of personal opinion, when God has not explicitly spoken, then I cannot be dogmatic where God is not. You and I cannot be dogmatic where God is not. Because your opinion may just be as good or as bad as mine. But when God says something, that's infallible truth. And for Paul, one of the things, his priorities in ministry is to make sure that people, as I go from place to place, will hear the truth of the word of God, not the word of men. Christians need to be inoffensive in particular opinions, but in matters of truth, we need to be bold. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4, what? Be angry. Did you ever notice that? Well, here in this passage, Ephesians 4, I think in verse 25, God is commanding me to be angry. But sin not. So, is it, so it's possible to be angry and sin not. Of course, Jesus Christ displayed that. And how did he? he it almost so looked like in the John chapter 2, he was having a temper tantrum. But he was not having a temper tantrum. He was in complete composure of his emotions. When he saw people selling and making the temple the house of thieves. You know what the narrative says, right? He literally turned the tables upside down in his anger. Because he said, you have made the temple of God a house of thieves. In other words, he did it. And you notice that passage? He says, because scripture says. So there are times we're called to be angry. When you know that about 70 million babies are being aborted. Despite being legal in this country. You ought to be angry. When you and I hear of the, the, the family under attack by Satan, by redefining marriage, as they're trying to do it already in the Philippines. But there it has been legalized. That's the advantage of being in the Philippines right now. Here, they have redefined marriage between a union of, of a husband and wife. That's the original wording. In the Philippines, they're trying to reword it to a union between two partners. That is a blatant, a satanic attack against the basic unit of society, the family. And sadly, in this country, they have legalized it. This is basically the Supreme Court saying, all right, we are protecting those who are fighting against God. And we are with these people who are raised in their arms of rebellion against him. And when we hear people lobbying and pressing that, then Christians ought to be angry. We have to be bold when we have to be bold. Like Paul, we should do it everywhere. Notice he says here, he did it preaching the gospel, bold in his teaching, publicly and from house to house. We do not have to be apologetic of the truth. Apologetics is not apologizing for the truth. It's defending the truth. Do not apologize for the truth. Rather, we are commanded to proclaim it, but to proclaim it in love. That's important. The content of our message should be truth. The manner of delivery ought to be in love. Ephesians 4.15. Am I really appalled when one preacher, one pastor in the Philippines, during a wake, when relatives were grieving, and the man in the casket he knew was not a saved man. And guess what he said? This man is right now in hell. Wow. Well, I'm telling the truth, he says. But that's very, that's very offensive. 
What the people needed was comfort. They can hear the message of the gospel. The gospel in itself is offensive. We don't have to add to it. So do not apologize for the truth. Let me close by pointing out what evangelism is. Okay? Just for this message. This is our first message. So when we get talk about evangelism, what is evangelism? One preacher in California in, interviewed a professor from a popular seminary in Texas. What is the gospel, sir? Professor in seminary. And he could not spell it out. If you were to be asked, what is the gospel? Are you going to grab with words? Uh, mm, eh, um, yeah, it's uh, what? Let me lay it down for you. First of all, the gospel is the propag evangelism, rather, is the propagation of a divine message. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.11, the Bible says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Who is the author of the gospel? It is God. He is the glorious God. This message that we deliver is the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And Paul says, which was committed to my trust. I'm not the author. I'm just a steward of it. And therefore, it's my responsibility to declare it accurately and faithfully. So I've been some member of Pastor, because his wife was, I'd rather her husband was studying law. And so they would read thick volumes of uh, books regarding law. I said, you should see the books that I've read. Louis Berkhoff and all these other systematic, boy, are they small. Uh, but we had to read all of them when I was going through my master's and ultimately even my doctoral degree. So sabi ng wife, mabuti ka pa pastore, you know. Uh, because we know, as far as we know, in the province, for as long as you're able to yell and shout, you can be a pastor. <laughs> See, listen, evangelism is the propagation of a divine message. We better know what God's message is. And that is what we should declare. We are not here to fabricate our message. We are to declare what's been given. So it's a propagation of a divine message. That's 1 Timothy 1.11. We saw that also partly in Galatians 1, 6 to 11. Second, it is the presentation of a divine person. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Very quickly. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto what? The gospel of God, which he, God, had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scripture. What is the gospel about? It's concerning a divine person. It's concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. It's speaking of his humanity. And was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. It's speaking of his deity. So, evangelism is number one, the propagation of a divine message. Second, it's a proclamation, a presentation of a divine person. Okay. Third, it is a proclamation of a divine work. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. We have here the gospel explained in capsulized form. You want to find an an, an, a detailed exposition of what the gospel is? Read Romans, the book of Romans. But you want, what is the gospel in capsulized, for, in capsulized form? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you what? The gospel which I preached unto you, by which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all, he already said it's the gospel, that which I also received, which is the gospel. How that, what is the gospel about? It's a divine work. A proclamation of a divine work. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Did you notice three subpoints in the proclamation of a divine work? First, this work is a saving work. Verse 2. I, he said, uh, By which you are saved. The gospel is a saving work. Number two, it is a finished work. How that Christ died. Greek tense, aorist, indica indica indicating punctilar action. Christ died. It's past tense. It's finished. Amen. How Christ died for our sins. 
Not only is it a saving work, it is a finished work, it is also a substitutionary work. He died for our sins. He who did no sin became sin for us. Sin was not found in him. Sin was imputed on him. Our sins. He did no sin. And yet Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, died in our stead. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree so that he could pay adequately the payment of our sins so that he can satisfy the outraged justice of a holy God and pour it upon himself to appease the anger of God. That anger that should have been poured on you and poured on me was poured on Jesus Christ, our substitutionary sacrifice. So that anyone who will take refuge and trust in Christ as Savior shall have forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life. But those who insist in rejecting and spurning the gracious offer of salvation, if you're one of them, the Bible says you will die in your sins. Jesus said, if you, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You will have to pay for the penalty of your own sin because you reject the penalty, uh, the payment that God himself has provided through the merits of his son, Jesus Christ. And if you are here watching or listening, you have not placed your trust in Christ as Savior. You're trusting in your human merit, in your religion, in your relics, in your rosary beads, in your righteousnesses. All of it combined. None of these can atone for your sins adequately. Rightfully so, for only the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, can cleanse us from our sin. And God the Father very clearly accepted the sacrifice of His Son as the only acceptable payment by raising His Son from the dead. Proof that he is God. Proof that all of his claims during his earthly ministry was vindicated. Proof that God the Father accepted the sacrifice of his son. And he will accept none other. And if you're not trusting in him, you will die in your sins. So it is a proclamation of a divine work. And lastly, it is a pronouncement of a divine ultimatum. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 7 through 9. If people reject the message of the gospel of the grace of God, what did the Apostle Paul say in verses 7 through 9? And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that who know not God and that obey not the gospel, what will happen to them? Those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. There is going to be eternal separation from the God of love. Notice eternal everlasting destruction. Hell is not a place that eventually you will cease to exist. The Bible does not teach annihilationism. When a person goes to hell, he just goes to the grave and ceases to exist. Not so. When it talks about destruction, it's not talking about, Paul is not talking about the loss of being. He's talking about the loss of well-being. People will be dying and burning and suffering in hell for all eternity. Everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That's the divine ultimatum that God has given as a pronouncement to all who will reject God's Son. This is biblical evangelism. It is a propagation of a divine message, a presentation of a divine person, a proclamation of a divine work, and it is a pronouncement of a divine ultimatum. If you do not trust in Christ, you will die in your sins. So, as we start our missions conference, evangelism conference i hope if you were to be asked what is the gospel or maybe you don't even have to be asked that you will be ready to give the answer in a world that is hurting in a world that is desperate one of the doctors told me in manila since the pandemic suicide rates had increased by 200 percent amazing we are living in a world that is so desperate and they need to hear a message of hope. Amen. But the hope that only God can give, yes. not us. It's the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you willing to be that instrument to deliver that divine message? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this message. We ask that your spirit will stir our hearts. Let thy word take deep root until it bears fruit in our lives. 
And we shall thank you in Jesus' name.